My name is Ann Smith, and I'm here with the second part of my program with my guest, Lawrence Okeu, um, who has had, to me, an extremely interesting life. Um, uh, I'm going to let him explain to you why we had to talk at the end of his last show. Uh, it went longer than we, um, than we planned because <laughs> I really didn't understand the complications of the education he received uh, at Southern uh, Methodist University in Texas, where he came from his birthplace <coughs> in Kenya to get a variety of degrees and to work towards becoming um, a minister in that denomination. So why don't you explain uh, once again, very briefly to the audience, how you came to be told that you couldn't do this thing anymore, mm. in case <clears throat> they miss our first show. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, uh, Anne. Uh, it's good to be back again here uh, in the studio with you uh, to continue the part two. Part of, two our, of the Lawrence Okeo show. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> very good. The part two of the Lawrence Okeo show. I'm so happy to uh, be invited again with you. And um, yes, uh, just a quick recap of our last um, show. Um, it is very obvious, I told you that I had to go through the candidacy process. And as I said, um, the candidacy process was the process of becoming an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. Um, the, the process is the same all over the United, uh, United States, but also with United Methodist affiliated churches in Africa and I think in Asia, all over the world. So um, it's a process that may go the longest, probably six to 12 years. Wow. Mm. Uh, but if everything had to work well within the three years, mostly it is paralleling the time the candidates are going to their seminary studies or um, theological trainings in the universities. So mostly School of Divinity takes, um, uh, School of Divinity takes four years, uh, Masters in Theology two years. So the, the, during those two years or four years of the School of Divinity, the highest, longest degree, uh, as candidates who, uh, which have been chosen from their, um, from their, uh, uh, let me say from their district, mm -hmm. um, they begin the process. So by the time they are done with, um, uh, uh, with uh, <clears throat> by the time they're done with their academic work, theological academic work, they, also, they are also set to become members of annual conference. Um, that is uh, ministers on probation. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, you're being posted. So I, I did it two times, but I did not know, I didn't understand the reason why the first time didn't go through, why the panel, the bishop's panel called the district, the district annual conference. I did not know why they couldn't be allowed to go on um, despite the doctrinal uh, writings which I did for them, trying to help them understand um, and you are, uh, 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 how you can articu uh, articulate the doctrinal uh, teachings mm -hmm. within the church. That was well done. But later on, as I told you, I went to another year again for the same conference under the, the, the same leadership, the DS, but I couldn't be moved on because, and then eventually I was told because of the readiness, um, uh, the readiness of the local uh, congregants that were not, they, see, they, think to, uh, they seem to think that they were not ready to have a black person or someone from Africa to be a minister there. So it was not a failure on your part to learn how to explain what the church stood for or what was taught. It, you know, you, had, you, were repeat, you were completing all the requirements that were asked of you, but the people, they were going to put you in as a spiritual leader to, mm -hmm. we're probably not ready to have a black man do this for them. That is what yeah. uh, the three representatives from the district annual conference were, 
uh, that were chosen to come and talk to me and tell me the reason why I couldn't be I couldn't be admitted to become a member of annual conference. That is what they told me. And uh, there was nothing I could do about that. I couldn't change my, my ethnicity or where I came from. Of course not. And neither could I change my color. <laughs> okay. and, you were, and you were determined not to go back to, 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 you could have been an ordained minister in Kenya. I could have been an ordained minister in Kenya, but I knew the idol that I, I will love to face with the African United Methodist Church in, in Kenya. Okay. I, I knew that the highest elevated universities that all of the churches in the United, United Methodist Church um, look to is Southern Methodist University. It is not just a, a, a church's university. This is a research, a research okay school, university, among okay. others in the United States. So this is the place where such credential would really make sense um, while you're trying to reach um, your people around the world or even within the United, uh, the, United, the, the United States here in America. So the failure was not the inability to articulate the polity, the politics of the church, it's called polity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the failure to articulate the polity of the United Methodist Church. I understood that from the, I was a good student academically in the university. Um, the failure was not to articulate the doctrinal teachings, uh, statements and teachings uh, to the people. They thought I was very uh, eloquent. I was eloquent. I was a very understanding and eloquent speaker. They said there was a guy who was an Indian by nationality or by, um, by race, uh, who had a doctor of philosophy from Southern Methodist University. School of Divinity is the highest, is the best school, the one at, uh, I mean, School of Divinity at Parkin School of Divinity is the best school of the United Methodist Church pretty much in the whole world. That's where everybody mm -hmm. wants to come and train in. And it, is, it happens to be one. So the student, it happens to be one of them that actually I went to. Um, the student came out there with a PA doctor of philosophy in theology. And he was posted to a local church there. And the, the representatives that were sent to me said, the, the church, the people left the church, the people. So I don't say that it could have been discriminatory in itself. I am simply saying that their experience informed them. And it looks mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. sometimes Plus, doing. It makes perfect sense. You see that? Yeah, yeah. They didn't so, want to set you up to face. This so sometimes they of... did not want to set me up for a failure. Yeah. But could there could there have been other ways of uh, of working with uh, uh, with uh, minority candidates like us? Um, could I be? Uh, could I have gone through the process and be assistant pastor somewhere else? Mm -hmm. In, in places like uh, Houston, where there's so many diversities, um, there were so many people are really mixed. Mm. But this decision was not made. So yes. you had to move on in a different direction. That's right. And I, and I believe from everything you told me, you were now thoroughly qualified from all of the academic studies and some of the experiences you had to be a community leader. And <sighs> For that, you said to yourself, I think, mm -hmm. uh, there are many ways to do this. That is right. <clears throat> that is very true. So, um, so I knew that um, I, had to, I had to come back to myself and be able to dig into the resources that are already been given by virtue of going to educational studies mm -hmm. or by, by virtue of just, you know, the abilities and the grace God has given me as a person. Um, and I begin to see that uh, School of Divinity trained me to be a community leader. So some of the concentrations that you, when you are doing a theological degree, there are concentrations. So Master's Divinity is not a general theological study. It is a concentration, a professional 
uh, a professional degree program uh, designed to train community leaders and uh, majority of whom, that majority of them that many people know out here, common person know, is just the ministers, the pastors. But majority of people that are doing leading nonprofit organizations, working in the civil rights movement like Dr. King, mm -hmm. majority of us are so familiar with Dr. King, his highest, uh, maybe his practical degree, apart from the doctor of philosophy that he has, could be said as uh, masters, uh, masters, of, uh, masters of divinity. Majority of people also do not understand the relationship between the law and, um, and, um, and religious studies like school of divinity. There is a study called moral theology, hmm? ethical moral study. It is deeply into the foundations that uh, literally formed the civilized societies all over the world. It is there that when I started practicing in a tax, law, a tax firm, a tax accounting firm in Texas, this firm was started with some uh, three Kenyans. I begin to see the correlations, the relationship between uh, ethical uh, studies I did in School of Divinity and the, and the practice of tax law. I stayed there for five to eight years. Um, not just uh, helping in, the, in this tax company, but also engaging in tax preparation and attempting to understand the law behind each and everything that we are doing. So um, there, are different, um, there are different laws, but I would say that tax law is very challenging because it keeps changing. It keeps changing. The Congress keeps making laws and the internal revenue keep finding ways through which it can be implemented down here. And so there is a constant rigor of study. So even right now, I have to continue doing continue education in tax law. Uh, constantly we are studying. Mm, constantly we are studying. So that is and how... And I have to say, mm -hmm. the only legal situation oh, that I've ever seriously been involved in as an American citizen mm -hmm. has been the preparation of my taxes every year. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm quite serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to take a, a, a big cut of uh, most people, some mm -hmm. people, of course, are in and out of court for a variety of reasons, and, and then there are all, you know, all the problems that people can have in life or, or mistakes they could make that could end them up in, in a legal situation, but everybody has to pay their taxes. Absolutely. And if this is so closely, and I never would have seen it before you explained it to me, mm -hmm. if this is so closely connected to all of the law, all of the body of law that underlies a civilized mm -hmm. um, uh, society, then what better way to reach a great many people mm -hmm. with what you have been taught Absolutely. and what you have learned in your long study of human behavior yes. and, um, and, and people's connection with the world and with God. Absolutely. Yes, so the human behaviors which when you do, when you take the, um, when you are in the school of divinity, so the major studies is sociology, where you study human behaviors, mm. mm -hmm. and um, psychology, where you go deeper into all those human behaviors, uh, and the social nature of the human being. Um, then, uh, then we have the biblical, uh, uh, dealing with the writings and the interpretations of different writings, not just scripture. People do not know the scriptures is a body of letters. So yes, it becomes a better way with the ethical understanding of, um, of the foundations of, uh, of what uh, formed the civilized communities uh, around the world, um, it couldn't be better than that. And that is the interest that inspired me to actually um, be doing uh, tax law now and continue wanting to, to deepen my understanding into tax, uh, taxes on system in the United States. And the clients <clears throat> you are most concerned with at this point mm -hmm are people from Africa mm -hmm. who uh, come here 
Uh, why, uh, why would they need a specialized uh, point of view in dealing with their approach to taxes? To me, it always looked pretty cut and dry. You just put the numbers in and you, uh, and, and you add it all up, and every year pretty much the same That's things sad. happen. Mm -hmm. But then I watched my parents do mm -hmm. their tax returns every year. Mm -hmm. uh, do Africans have? A background in understanding personal income tax. Mm, that's a very good question. So, um, so, so as I have said, um, a tax law keep changing. Um, a typical example is the way um, is the challenges that have been that have come because of the pandemic, uh, the COVID nineteen, and um, we have seen. We have seen the most important body um, in the government is being the Internal Revenue, the Treasury, uh, and the Congress. So the Congress keep adapting laws related to what is what is actually became a global emergency, and um, and the, the Internal Revenue keep finding ways through which these things can be understood and these tax credits can be can be uh, articulated uh, in the communities and how people can benefit from them during this busy, uh, difficult time. Tax law, I mean to simply say, tax, tax law keep constantly keep changing. And the idea that you will just keep doing it, the forms looks like they don't change as much, but even the forms can be added. And uh, there are thousands of federal forms. <laughs> And the state forms, a lot. Yeah. lot. So, but when you learn only how to do yours, it looks like you can always see the form as the same. But when you are doing tax return, you are dealing with so many t forms, federal mm -hmm. and state forms. Um, majority of Africans, uh, immigrants that are coming here, um, they come from a tradition that do not have a taxation system like the one you have or you were born into yes, in the United States. So. so that is one challenge. So uh, personally, I am a first, a first immigrant um, in the United States from Kenya. Mm? Uh, there's no any other members of my family <clears throat> that have been here. But I'm the first generation, OK? Now, um, Many people are familiar that the government in Kenya is built by, by taxation, just like here. What many people cannot articulate is how that tax, <laughs> how that tax, uh, taxation system actually affects the common people and on the ground here. Okay. okay. Uh, when I grew up in, um, uh, in 1980s, I used to see people come to uh, they, we will call them tax collectors uh -huh, okay. <laughs> uh, in Kiswahili to Nawaita um, wamekuja kuchukua kodi, uh, kodi collectors. Uh, these people would come and literally chasing after animals and chickens and I think it would be sold and then paid to us, it, uh, put into money and paid to the treasury. That was that thing went for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so they would assess your value by taking a look at what you had, what you and then take their cut. Yeah, <laughs> if you said you didn't have money, they said, but you have goats and you have chickens, <laughs> and uh, part of it could be equated to the tax liability that you you are needed to pay, uh -huh. and you paid it. Many people were not happy to see chickens oh, going were. and the goats going. I cannot forget those experiences. So, so it's very, very different in what Americans commonly call third world countries, uh, the whole taxation system. So it isn't just Africa. I mean, your story about the goats and chickens delights me, but uh, this must have been happening all over the world even now, although modern times have made things a little different. Uh, talk some more about that, what, 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 your, what your customers <laughs> or people who come to you for advice, uh, what they don't know. Majority of people, majority of com na uh, nations, uh, communities, uh, they truly, um, this truly doesn't have the kind of robust system of taxation like we have here in America. So I would easily, uh, I would still imagine things like that still happens 
Um, but uh, in Kenya, we have progressed a little bit. I mean, we have progressed. Um, there is a certain amount of money uh, an individual or businesses must make um, uh, in order for them to file a tax return. So the filing of a tax returns, electronic filing that we do here, um, is actually happening in, uh, let me just talk of my country, Kenya, where I come from. Um, about, uh, apart from that, majority of people would not make uh, uh, 1 million or 10,000 US dollar, uh, 1 million Kenya shillings, to be able to, um, to be able to really feel that they, they are giving some part of their money um, uh, for the local government or the central government in any way. So, so these things are happening, but you know, people do when, whenever the sales taxes are there. So majority of people only when they buy something. There are um, sales taxes so, in Africa. Yeah, so the okay. sales taxes are there, and that is the common way through which I think many governments are collecting taxes, uh, especially from common people. And that is what many common people may, may know or may not know. So when people come to the United States, like most of the immigrants from African countries, um, they, they don't really quite get the tax, uh, the taxation system in the United States. It's more, it's, it's complicated and uh, constantly changing. And even people like us who, uh, this is our profession, we constantly have to keep up with, um, uh, with information coming from the internal revenue. Um, I mean, uh, 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 from the IRS, as many people know it. So, um, because the community here is, everything keeps changing. Congress keep making laws. And the laws are passed to the Treasury, and the Treasury found a way through which a common people down here will understand them through tax companies. Uh, so things, so it is more robust. This is why we are inviting. Um, I am inviting this time uh, immigrants to come, come to the office and, um, and be able to, uh, um, I can spare some time to explain a number of few things, uh, basics of uh, uh, tax system in the United States so that uh, they can be comfortable. You know, it, 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 just a possibility just mm. occurred to me. <clears throat> and your your present your office is presently in the uh, Immigrant Welcome Center down on Preble Street, 24 Preble Street, on the uh, second and third floor of that building. Absolutely. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Third are, and fourth. We are in the third. We are on the third uh, floor. So the, our, my office is on the third floor, uh, but the Immigrant Center floor. Um, is on that fourth floor. Well, it just occurred to me, though, and perhaps you and I or possibly Bazia should talk to Reza, the man who directs this program. Mm -hmm. He might want to have an open house at some point before taxes need to be filed, some um, weekend or some afternoon or some, whenever he thought would be a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we have the, still have the corona problem, mm -hmm. but sometime when you could just... Uh, uh, you could just be available to briefly talk to anybody who comes in that day, because there are larger rooms that, that is, you could assemble in. That is, um, that would be such a, um, uh, a strategy, not only for educating, uh, not only for educating, uh, giving the basic information and education on, on the tax uh, system here, but also, I can I, will, I see that as a marketing strategy also for my business. That would be really good. Uh, that one of the great dangers, particularly if you uh, go and become an incorporated LLC, one of the big problems for uh, for newcomers to the United States mm -hmm. is they think that getting the paperwork done for their company, whether it's a, a local grocery, you know, or a hairstyling salon, or you know, whatever it is they're trying to sell, they think that those papers and the fees they pay initially, mm -hmm. uh, that's it, right? Yes, absolutely. But they are unfortunately quite mistaken. Why don't you explain about the taxation of businesses a little bit um, and fees? So you see, the um, uh, depending with the business structure. Uh, that the business itself, the owner chose. Uh, some of the business structures is a limited liability company. LLC. Uh, LLC. Yep. Um, 
LLCs were started with the state and then after that all other states adopted that and the federal accepted it. Um, but some people are S-Corp, S-Corporations, mm -hmm. uh, some business structures, and uh, those are also uh, structures of taxation. Of um, There's ad tax advantages in this in these structures of business. They're not just um, types. Uh, mostly they're tied with the benefits of taxes that you would save. Uh, S-Corporation, for example, would be good for much more um, organized businesses uh, with uh, payroll and um, and uh, uh, probably reasonable salary draw for the owners. Um, those could be some of the um, qualifications. IRS would want, do, uh, do you have a reasonable salary? Um, so there must be a reasonable salary and um, it, it is engaging much more and in that way um, um, in that way, choosing S Corp uh, would save um, this uh, business owner from a double taxation. A double oh, taxation. Even, I've never even heard of that. So a double taxation is like you have a business, you have a 1040. So while you are allowed to file to do your LLC Schedule C and also do your 1040 in the same tax return, you will pay on the profit from of the business of the from the profit or loss that you've made on the business and you will um, you will also be paying uh, on your 1040 like most of us the withholding and things like that um, that profit is taken from the schedule c and brought to to become your income of what oh, you made okay. therefore you are being taxed there again so um, it becomes a double taxation um, in that way, but if you would have uh, S corporation, you would have, um, you would, um, and let's say that um, one that is organized, you have a payroll, then you would only consider the payroll taxes, but not necessarily pay again uh, the 1040 schedule C or whatever. It would limit you. So um, uh, it is advantageous for businesses that are much more organized. Um, but if it is just a simple tax return, you don't have a payroll, I would say that it is still good up to that extent to simply have it all done together. So uh, as COP, you would do it different. You, oh, the tax, okay. the business will be doing itself, and you and your family, you will remain doing taxes by your family. So, so mm -hmm. I, at this point, I would just like to say that, that you have made your services available, and at the end of this program, we will, we will show how to reach you uh, in a uh, thing on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and you also said that, you know, you would not, in order to ask you questions, you could set up an appointment when it was convenient, and they would not necessarily have to pay you any fees, just for an initial you know, talk about what they need. Yeah, there will be no, uh, the, there will be no fee. Uh, this would be, I would consider that as a marketing, as a time spent on marketing uh, and advertisement. So um, if that can be organized, that would be great. Um, I would like people to really understand um, the, uh, the basics of doing tax return in the United States. Well, and I thank you so much for coming in and giving this um, talk about your own uh, history and, and your business. Many, many heroes, heroes and the